Hi guys. Hello. <laughs> Paul Miller, aka Polly the Clown, owns Circus Mojo and Bo Burkus Brewery, and he's one of my oldest and dearest friends. We met doing Shakespeare in the Park when we were just kids, and I think we learned a lot during that time about uh, that, that we gave back. I think it's fair to say when people mentored us and sort of showed us the way and, and made a path for us. I think Paul has certainly turned that around and you'll hear his story, how he's taken what we learned and is now reaching out to children and planting those seeds that are going to be harvested in future generations. It's been a privilege to watch Paul grow up and one of the defining moments in his life that I'm going to tell on him for was when he was in his senior year at the University of Cincinnati Conservatory of Music and his mother was a college professor and Paul dropped out to join the circus and became a Ringling Brother clown. <clears throat> yeah, those would have been some fun times at home. They were happy. They were thrilled for me. <laughs> yes, yes. But, but it turned out great for Paul, and it gave him a career and a life that allowed him to reach out to other people. After he left Ringling Brothers, he went on to do soap operas and to do television. And I have to tell you, I was so jealous of his Ringling Brothers time because he's traveling with Ringling Brothers, and I was traveling with the Sloan's Gypsies, who got their name off the back of a toilet. And so he had a much more glamorous time in his box in the train. Um, then he, come, he, he returned home after all of that time, and now he's, he's created Circus Mojo, and he's created Berkus Brewery, and he is planting those seeds, and he is doing things for kids, and he's using Circus to create jobs and to build communities, and so I'm going to let him tell you about that. Hey, thank you, Terry. Well, circuses are fueled by concessions, so I started the Birkus Brewing Company, and uh, I saw, do you got Roll Out the Barrel? Do you got that one on the piano, piano guy? Could you play that for us? Oh, let's hear it for the musician in the house, everybody. Oh, we got more dragon rights. I was in the can, and I saw all your Oktoberfest stuff, so we'll roll out the barrel. Put it together one more time for the piano man. Clap your hands. <laughs> Actually, it's, you didn't know this is Cecil's birthday party, did you? They booked a clown for his party. Just the party clown, kids. All right, um, nice to see everybody. Uh, my name is Paul Miller. I did join the circus. It's been a lot of fun. And the circus, it's fun, it's dangerous, and there will never be a chat GPT AI robot circus, okay? Don't worry. We're not going anywhere. Circus has been around for thousands of and thousands of years, but I'll take it back when I'm 96, 97, when I dropped out of college to join the circus, I bounced a chair on my chin, and that's how I got work on the soap opera. And the dean was not too pleased, nor my parents when I dropped out, but it was fun to say, hey, turn on channel five. I got three lines today, so. Uh, As the world turns, all my children, but one life to live, I got to say things like, good to see you." <laughs> oh, and, and this one? This one's on me. <laughs> yeah, great bartender lines. Great, great bartender lines. But, um, you know, there's a lot of people in Cincinnati who work for PNG. I also work for PNG. So, also, as the world turns, or all my children, one or the other, but your paycheck comes from Procter & Gamble, which is uh, interesting. So, um, here's a little unsolicited romantic advice. If you're going to drop out of college to join the circus, Ask your girl to marry you before you do that, or she will not be there when you return. So, uh, we've been, uh, my wife Renee and I, we've been married uh, 26 years, and uh, you survive a circus, there's not much you can't survive, you know? And our kids are 16 and 18, and um, it was fun. When they were little, they're like, Why can't we go to Walt Disney World? And I said, Well, Walt's not hiring. We're working in uh, Germany this summer, kids, you know? So, it was a lot of fun. If you're 
in fifth grade and you haven't been to Gatlinburg, you're kind of a nobody. You know, like if you don't have an airbrush t-shirt and you've never seen a bear, it's like, oh, so my kids were like, Dad, when are we going to go to Gatlinburg? The summer prior to that, we were in um, Switzerland and driving through the mountains. And my wife and I had a lot of fun teasing Hope and Lucas. They're like, when are we going to be there? When are we going to be there? I'm like, oh, we'll be there soon. So they thought it was going to be Switzerland mountains, not the great smoky mountains. Okay. <laughs> so so we're, 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 when are we going to be there? When are, oh, we don't see any mountains. Oh, we're going to be there. We're going to be there. And then we get out and it's, you know, the sign, Great Smoky Mountains, and they're both kind of like disappointed, right? So it's all perspective. Um, so we lived in New York City for a couple of years, and I had to pay $8,000 to rent an apartment. So I got my New York real estate license because, you know, it was $8,000 just to rent an apartment. It was at 108th and um, Columbus. So it was like Central Park ends at 110th Street. But we had a two-bedroom apartment with a little roof patio. There were 40 people in line for this building. And it was a no-pets building, but my wife and I had a little dog, a little stogie, a little dachshund, because they were bred to keep the rats out of the castle. And there are a lot of rats in Manhattan, okay? It was a 72-step walk-up, though. So they didn't get, they, they wouldn't, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit for those rodents, right? But uh, we had a lot of fun in New York City and uh, left for Japan. I was a clown in Japan for six months, and this was a gig. It was at a hot springs bath resort. I worked 12 minutes a day. Yeah, that was pretty good. Two Chinese acrobats, two jugglers from the Czech Republic, and the amazing comedy of Paul Mira. <laughs> they have a difficult time saying their L's and their R's in there. Um, and for me, that was fascinating because there's not a lot of places where a white guy can experience overt racism. but. In Japan, um, they call us Gaijin, which translates to um, hairy southern bastard, okay? <laughs> like, <laughs> that's their derogatory term for white guys. And uh, it's because, like, Marco Polo, like, was covered in hair and sailed in from the south, and that's their derogatory term. So little people would call us Gaijin, old people would call us Gaijin. We got kicked out of restaurants because they didn't want foreigners in their restaurant. And it was, um, it was... It was fantastic to be there, only working 12 minutes a day, and experience um, something that was not Judeo-Christian, you know, like very so specifically. Like there were, there was an African American from Cleveland, two guys from Wales, and my wife and I. We were the only foreigners in the whole prefecture, which would be like I don't know Mason County, let's say. I mean, in, in, in the scheme of things. So that was neat. Um, came back from Japan and um, went to Chicago. So I got cast in a movie in Chicago, and that cured me of wanting to be an actor. The movie didn't get quite go anywhere, but they paid our rent while we were making the movie, and then September 11th happened. And um, that was a pause. It was, uh, what am I doing? You know, do I want to be a movie star, or do I want to do something that's meaningful? So I started a circus program called Circus Theme, um, building self-esteem through the circus arts. First I called it Sir Kids, because I thought that was kind of catchy, like Sir Kids, Circus. But this was before Google. So I started Sir Kids, I made a little letterhead, and then I got a book by a guy named Bob Sugarman, and there was a group in Canada called Sir Kids. So I had to change the name because trademark infringement is something you learn a lot about when you're a clown, okay? So Circus Theme was our name, and our tagline was the greatest kids on earth. And uh, I got a cease and desist letter from my former employers, the Ringling Brothers. And... Uh, so I got pro bono lawyers um, from, uh, I think, Mayor Brown. Yeah, so the lawyers for the creative arts, they helped us set up a nonprofit, 501c3. I read nonprofits for dummies, but I got a little bit of help. Um, so like, we got the lawyers, we got it set up, and they got pro bono lawyers for us. And it was cool. It was really cool because we settled out of court. They said, did you know we, we were there in the Sears Tower back when it was the Sears Tower, before it was the Willis Tower. This is a long time ago. And the lawyers from Ringling, you know, she flew in, Julie Strauss is her name, and I knew her from my time with Ringling. And I said, did you know Utah had to change their license plates? The license plates said the greatest snow on earth. And Ringling sued them, and they had to change all their license plates. They escalated it up the chain of command, like all the Utah, you know, all the Mormons thought they could take on the circus. You cannot. This, I mean, this is, this is trademark infringement. So they had to change everything. And... I knew that, I heard that on 60 Minutes, but I didn't know they beat Al's greatest used car sale on earth at the state level. So I was like, oh, I did not know about that one. I said, but we can go to court. 
it's going to be fine. We'll go to court. I'll pack the courthouse with Sudanese and Eritrean refugees, and uh, we will get on the news, and I will make it fantastic for you. Because they were like, people are going to get confused. I was like, no one is going to get confused. We are not going to buy a train. I'm not going to hire any elephants or feed any elephants. And um, it was great. We settled out of court. They paid us $600. You know, I said, if you give me a thousand bucks, we'll buy new t-shirts. We'll change our slogan. And this was when who wants to be a millionaire was a big deal. And uh, I said, you got no more lifelines. Um, if you give us a thousand bucks, we'll uh, buy new t-shirts. And they came back with like $500. And I'm like, you guys made a billion dollars last year, okay? And they do. They own Walt Disney on Ice. They own uh, Monster Truck Jam. Um, every live family entertainment, Jurassic Park, the Ringling Brothers parent company owns all of those groups. Now they sell a $9 box of popcorn back in 1996. How much does that box cost? Anybody know? What's that? 38 cents. Two cents. How much does a popcorn cost? One cent, okay? Now they're making $8.97 on every single box of popcorn. Isn't that crazy? And the building loves them. If you own the building, say there's the Maysville Arena and the Ringling Brothers come to town, the Ringling Brothers, they let you keep all of the parking revenue and all of the ticket revenue. So we are talking cha-ching, all right? It's not like Miley Cyrus or, you know, Britney Spears, you know, or Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift, they're paying Taylor to come to your town, right? But Ringling, they let you keep everything. All they want is the hustle granddad or grandma or mom or dad in there to buy a $12 cotton candy that costs eight cents, all right? A $9 box of popcorn that costs three cents, all right? So it is a fascinating hustle. It's a concessions business. And uh, I'll get to my brewing company here in a minute. But the circus was a lot of fun. I learned some tough lessons though, because Circus Theme, I ended up getting fired uh, from that organization, which I founded, and they used trademark infringement as one of the ways that they got me, you know? So after Ringling sued us, they put Circus Theme in the name of a 501c3, and then when it was time to go, it was time to go. So like, say you started Rotary, and you, you know, say you started Rotary, but Rotary should be for everybody. So I'm really proud of Circus Theme. It's around, it was, uh, they celebrated their 20, uh, wow, 22 years in business. Put your hands together for the Circus Freaks up there in Chicago. Yes, that's right. I had some board members. We had a whole lot of dollars, and we've kissed and made up since then. But that's what I like to do. I like to learn some things because we weren't born walking. Were we kids? No? How long did it take you to learn how to walk? One year. One year? Okay. It was good. Not bad. I'm going to teach you kids how to bounce a keg on your chin later today. Does that sound good? No. No? <laughs> My buddy Steve-O uh, from Jackass, he got kicked out of clown college, okay? So in the circus, they say, be good, be good at it, or don't get caught. So I went to 96, and he went to 97, but that trick's got me kicked out of many Applebee's in my day, you know? But you get a chance to learn it. You know, maybe we'll do that right now. You want to learn a trick? Yeah, let's learn a trick. Come on. I got peacock feathers. If you're going to bounce a keg first, it starts with a peacock feather. Here, Carrie, help me pass these out, would you? You don't have to bounce the feather, okay? In some countries, kids are forced to be in the circus, but not in these United States of America. You know what? But it's really, come on, Brad. Stand up. All right. Put, put, your, put in your hand and just balance it. Nice and easy. Keep it perpendicular. There you go, Larry. There you go. Come on. Do you need one? Come on. All right. Stand up and try and balance it. Stand up. Stand up. Give it a shot. Give it a whirl. Pass those on. Stand up, stand up, or more sit down. Oh, this is what don't, don't tell them it's easy, baby. You gotta sell it. Come on, you gotta sell it. Well, this is you gotta sell it. Come on, come on, come on. What do you got in there? Right, right, right. <laughs> I, I want to train nice for women. <laughs> 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 hey, you get what you get, kid. You don't get upset. Well, no, no. You just gotta use it. Look at the top of the feather and balance it. Keep it perpendicular. Nice. Okay, people, you got to smile, though. you got to work your money maker. Sell it. They don't pay money for this. <laughs> good, good, good. Work it. Work it. Sell it. Nice. All right, now try it on one finger. See if you can bounce the feather on one finger. Can it be done? Can't. Can't be done. Oh, nice. Good work, Ty. Good work. Nice, nice, nice. Nice. <laughs> 
All right, these peacocks, uh, these are for you to keep, everybody, okay? Take them home, take them home, take them home. There'll be a few more up here if you like them. So if you ever want to balance a keg on your chin, um, work your feather on your chin, okay? But don't put the feather on your nose because it could fall on your eyeball, all right? Now, I don't know if you've seen Captain Phillips, but pirates, they've got it pretty tough these days, okay? <laughs> pirates, don't let, don't let it fall on your eyeball. All right, chins are legal, noses are illegal, but if you want to get the keg, you go feather, yardstick, push broom, folding chair. I can do a shopping cart. I do a 12 inch, uh, 12 foot fiberglass ladder. Oh, that's a pretty good one at Home Depot. That one, that one, so that's a good trick right there, okay? So um, anyway, a clown's life. We've done a lot of work in Chicago, but I got my butt kicked. I learned some really good lessons. And this was November 2009. Does anybody remember 2009, the end of the world? Like, if you had initials, they were bailing you out. GM, bailed out. AIG, bailed out. GE, bailed out. Uh, you know, it was just, they were, it, it was weird. But it was a great time to buy an old movie theater in Ludlow, Kentucky. All right? So I had started Circus Steam at a 1920s movie theater in Chicago. It was the Columbia College Dance Hall. And then some of the board members, they wanted to develop a certain part of uh, Chicago. So they relocated the Columbia College Dance Hall from uptown to this new part of town. Because artists are always the tip of the spear. They're always the first piece of the puzzle. Before you get a Walgreens and a Starbucks and condos, there's an artist there producing something in a cheap place to do it. Because artists, you know, we don't have money to buy stuff, usually, you know. But I can thank my New York real estate uh, license because I learned about historic tax credits and I learned about uh, environmental uh, EPA, Superfund sites, etc. So in Ludlow, this was an old movie theater, but it had four pieces of the puzzle. It was zoned entertainment, because zoning, that's where deals go to die, all right? It was already zoned. They couldn't take the zoning away. It was, uh, had 20 foot ceilings, all right? It had level floors because it was a factory. The movie theaters are poured concrete like this, okay? Like, and then um, it had three-phase power. So you need three-phase to run their projector. So back in the 40s when this building was built, they didn't have light bulbs bright enough to project film. So literally it was like a Frankenstein arc of electricity. Like three-phase came in and it went across the two terminals. It was bright enough to project this uh, movie like 100 feet away and... Um, so it was great. The factory bought it because they needed the three phase to run their big giant machines. And the factory leveled the floor. So that was critical. Now, most breweries that you go to, you'll find in industrial corridors because they have three phase already. Because you need three phase to run your giant brewing equipment. And in Ludlow, because the town's 100 and almost 160 years old, it's gray water. So all, everything, rainwater, sewage, brewing, everything goes into the same SD1 trough. Another critical piece of the puzzle. So... We bought this building and we offered, I, it was funny, I, you know, I offered half of the asking price, which was their tax value. And um, they, were, they were really irritated, and, uh, but at least I got under contract. Once you get under contract, you can have someone go and do an inspection. And once this inspection happened, you know, there may be mold in this building, totally was mold because there were holes in the roof and the insulation was a mess. And we may have lead-based paint. Oh, we absolutely had tons of lead-based paint. So this is a little strategy from a real estate perspective. It was gonna cost at least as much as my asking price to remediate these issues. So we got a good deal on the building and we set on a project of getting it done. 2009, I hired a guy who was laid off from some of the <laughs> lead-based paint work of one of the bridges in Covington. I think it was the Roebling Bridge. And he had all the paperwork to take all the ceiling down. We put a new rubber, uh, rubber coating on the roof. So we sealed the roof, we fixed the ceiling, and we set up our little project to do some circus in town. We bought the old uh, Love Though Package Liquors, which was next door, and we set up a little circus studio there. And um, we put an ADA bathroom in this building because I do a lot of work with people um, who are handicapped. If you are in a wheelchair, uh, what are the two activities you do for... Uh, what is your activities director? Anybody got some ideas? What, what are some ideas? What can you do if you're in a wheelchair from an activities perspective? Come on. Wheelchair basketball. Okay, wheelchair basketball. That's good. That's high, that's high skill, but absolutely. What else? Anybody? Bumper bowling. Okay, this is a big deal. You they go bumper bowling. And bingo. I mean, how much fun is bingo, everybody? I mean, talking fun, right? So we're talking years of wheelchair basketball, 
um, bumper bowling, and bingo. Guess what you could do though? You could bounce a feather. You could spin a plate. You could learn to juggle. We can teach you hat tricks. So we had a really great project. Like we do a lot of work with stroke victims. Like if you've lost the use of half of your body, the other half of your body could balance that feather all day long. And that is fun. When you activate someone who's had a stroke and has been in a space where people don't really engage them very much, and then they start to bounce a feather, and then their nieces and nephews want to come around because every week um, Uncle Ralph has a new trick, all right? So you visit Uncle Ralph on Monday, and Uncle Ralph's teaching you feather balancing. You visit next week, Uncle Ralph's teaching you hat tricks. Next week, Uncle Ralph's teaching you to juggle a Kroger's bag and a Walgreens bag. And all of a sudden, these kids, we get them off their telephones, and they want to hang out with their relative who's been pretty much like tuned out to them forever. So we put an ADA bathroom in our space. This is 2010. And we opened up our program to like kids in Ludlow. And it was great because there's a lot of like little troublemakers in every town, okay? In Chicago, there's troublemakers. In Maysville, there's troublemakers. In Ludlow, there's troublemakers. And I will say this. I believe we're going bankrupt locking up these troublemakers, all right? Like we gotta turn these troublemakers into taxpayers, okay? So this is the deal. We have a three bedroom apartment above our ADA studio and we start working with kids. We work with kids who um, were in the system, who were in juvenile detention, uh, who were in for um, robbing people in Chicago. And I worked with the Northern Kentucky Area Development District to get an apprenticeship program. So we had funding to hire kids, not only from Ludlow, but also from Chicago and from Cincinnati, who were literally in jail for causing trouble. Now this is dangerous. This is a slippery slope we take. But our Catholic residential services, we had eight ladies in wheelchairs in 2011. All right, they're getting excited. That eight people turned into 18 people. So what do you do? You have to hire some apprentices. So simultaneously, I'm working at the Hamilton, uh, Hamilton County Juvenile Detention Center, Hillcrest, all right? And these kids are in for stealing cars. Um, they are focused and they are fearless. The skills you need in the circus, okay? So we trained the kids, vocational training. We came, trained them in jail. When they got out of jail, we hired them to work with us in Ludlow. Now this was, this was fantastic because Catholic Charity said, you can't have those people working with our kids, or with our patients, or our clients, let's say. And I said, what would Jesus do? <laughs> Which is like, well, they don't like that much. They don't like that at all. Uh, <laughs> um, and then, then they said, well, if, if, they're, if they're sex offenders, we, we, uh, our insurance won't cover it. And I said, you're 2,000 years too late on that one, Catholic Church, which is uh, below the bill, okay? But as 12 years of Catholic school, okay, I, I called them back. I, I, they, they were not happy. And... I asked to speak to the people in charge, and I said the Memorari, which is a prayer I used to have to write like 10 times a day. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that ever was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection or sought the intercession was left united, inspired by the conscious I fly to thee over, I mean, just crazy old school Catholic prayer that I had to write a whole bunch when I was a troublemaker in, in grade school. <laughs> and then they took me seriously, and I said, I apologize, and I will work with the judge and I'll figure out what these people are in for. We'll black their names out, I'll get the full dossier so you'll know exactly what's going on because you're right, they're gonna be around my kids and they're gonna be around my staff and we should have an understanding of, now, I knew that if you are a sex offender, you're not in this system, you're in a separate system completely, but I still played along, the judge handed it to us and we had three kids fresh out of jail getting paid a salary to teach circus to old people in wheelchairs in Ludlow. Put your hands together for that. Come on. I mean, that is, because you know what? We have no shortage of old people and we have no shortage of people in jail, okay? We just don't. I mean, these are, this is like pipeline, pipeline. And when these kids got their first paycheck, I was like, there was a check cashing place right across the street from the theater in Ludlow. We used to have a check cashing place, uh, a mobile, boost mobile cell phone store, and these are like banes on your community. Like if your community has a no grocery store but a check cashing place and a cell phone, that means the drug dealers are running town because all the people from Indian Hill and all the people from Fort Thomas, they come to Ludlow, they buy their little boost mobile phone, their burner, they go and they buy their dope, and then they go back home. Like this is, this is the thing that happens often, not just in Ludlow, in every little crazy place. So I said, watch, 
if you can hold on to your check, I will take you to the bank and we'll set up an account for you. And the kids are like, they were minors, 16 and 17 years old. No way. Nobody in my family has a bank. And I said, if you can just hold your check for a day, Ludlow like Savings Bank is closed right now, but if you can just hold your jets, I will set up an account. One kid didn't listen, and he took his $174 check to the check cashing place. And how much did they get? Anybody know? What was a check cashing place take from $174? Huh? 20 dollars 20 More than that. And he came out with 50 bucks. Yeah, you know, it's, there's $29.99, there's $29 fee. And then there's another $20 fee if you don't have an ID. And then there's a 13, 18, 20% of whatever the, whatever the, and, and just if you're not that bright, they will add some other stupid fee on there and then you'll just be happy to walk out with less than half of your check. And they can just make all this up because it's a kid, the kid doesn't know, and the kid doesn't have an ID. And the bank decides, oh, Circus Mojo, Circus Mojo, Circus Mojo, oh, that check will clear. And it was a great lesson for the other two guys who, uh, did the tail down of their check because the next day um, I added them this is a great little hack and please Homeland Security don't get me in too much trouble here because well what we did was I learned this in Chicago because I set up bank accounts for a whole bunch of young kids uh, who were underage who, who wanted their own bank didn't want the folks to take the dollars because that's the other thing if you give my mom a check she's gonna take it you know so if you uh, here's a little hack if you have a corporation you can add additional signers and make them assistant uh, treasurers, okay? So they were all assistant treasurers for my corporation. I added them as additional signers and I opened up three savings accounts and they were um, the additional signers on all these accounts, all right? Which is fun. Fun way for these kids to have a bank. And there's only one let those savings bank and they knew exactly what I was doing and they wanted to make sure that this worked. And it was great because I told the kids, you better make sure you have at least $25 in your account because what's gonna happen, you're gonna go and think you have $20 and Fifth Third is not gonna be able to let 250 or you know, they're living in Bond Hill, they're living over in Cincinnati, you know, they, they even if they went to some little corner market, $20, you can't get $20 out, you gotta keep $25 in there. One kid didn't listen, so they lost a couple days pay because they couldn't afford the bus to go from Bond Hill to Ludlow. Well, you're in great learning, great lessons here. So I showed him a little hack. We went up the next, uh, maybe the next week, all three of us, four of us, me and three other guys, we went up to the Walgreens up in Fort Wright, and I showed them what they needed to do was to buy a box of condoms and get $5 cash back, all right? Like, if you have less than $20 and you can't get your money, go buy some deodorant, go buy some condoms, go buy gum, buy anything, take your $5 out, and this is how you can work the hack. Now, that's sex ed that works, okay? Because these kids, they didn't know their dad, most of them, some of them, all right? And they have to be learned, and they have to be taught, they have to hear like a lesson that is point blank, and that's a fun lesson. I don't know how much more time I've got. How much more time I got, Carrie? 10 minutes. 10 minutes, all right. So that's the circus. But if you're not a drug dealer, all right, you gotta keep you know, making it work. So. Beer is my drug, all right? It's highly taxed, all right? It takes a really long time to get all your license together, everything else. So in 2012, the city of Ludlow, they gave me a beer license, all right? This is weird, but, you know, in 20, 2009, we bought the building. 2010, things are coming on. 2011, we did a big thing with ArtsWave. I applied for an ArtsWave sampler, and they said, well, you're not a nonprofit. And I said, I've learned lessons. I'm not gonna be a nonprofit. And I said, well, you should do an event with us because your mission is creating communities through the arts, okay? So are you going to live by your mission or are you going to live by some silly bylaws? I mean, we're talking $600. Why don't you go ahead, give me the 600 bucks, we'll throw a party for you in Ludlow. And that was a great push because we put new carpet in, we painted everything, we got this new glass storefront on the theater. Um, I knew it wasn't historically accurate, okay? But I submitted my permits, we did it. And then there's a group called the Madisonville Art Center over in Cincinnati. And three rich guys put up a million bucks, set up a nonprofit, bought a building for a dollar, paid union prevailing wages to fix this building up, put about 400 grand into light seats and sound equipment, and they had the Madisonville Art Center. Well, nobody would go to Madisonville, all right? And it was rough. There was a lot of drug deals going on. There was a lot of problems. 
Well, guess what? Nobody from Ludlow knew that Madisonville was a little bit sketchy. So my building was environmentally uh, difficult. So we started doing events at the Madisonville Art Center. And we sold that thing out three times. And then the building got shot up in a drug deal. So they had to close it. So they approached me and said, hey, Paul, here's our receipts. You know, here's $400,000 worth of stuff. If you give us 100 grand, you could take it all. And I said, that's cool. Let me see. So hey, it was tricky. Nobody was lending money to a clown in Ludlow in 2010, 2011. Okay, <laughs> nobody was doing it. Uh, I had sponsored a visa for a guy from Germany. Um, his partner was the head, of the law head lawyer for the German Stock Exchange. So they helped seed us with like um, 10,000 bucks. So I had 10 grand. I said, hey guys, if you sell me this stuff for uh, $60,000, I can get you 10 grand in the next five days. And you could just carry a note, put a UCC lien on the equipment, give me a year, I'll twist balloons on the street corner, I'll work Cecil's birthday party, I'll do whatever it takes, you know what I mean? Um, so they sold me the stuff, and it was great. Then I had all the guts to make my theater work. I approached Ludlow, I said, hey, you got any uh, economic incentives, any revolving loan funds, things like that? They're like, no, sorry. And then the Northern Kentucky Area Development District, like this group exists to create jobs and to help things happen. I approached the Ad District. They're like, oh, that sounds interesting. Talk to the SBDC. So I went to the SBDC, and they're like, this is weird, but all right. So they put all these projections together, and then the Ad District was like, all right, go find three banks that are going to turn you down, and then we'll consider the loan application. I'm like, man, you want to talk about, like, oh, like, how silly is that? Go apply to three banks and be turned down so then we can fund you. But that's okay. You know, I, I like to follow the rules, so I, I, I got the thing. The, the ad district gave us sixty thousand dollars in working capital, which is pretty cool, you know. Um, but Ludlow said, "Oh, you know, we'll do. We'll give you a beer license." And I said, "I got a bunch of little punk kids. I do not want punk kids, teenagers, and a tight wire and beer in the same building. Like that is a recipe for disaster." And they said, "Well, we'll sell you a building for a dollar." I was like, "A building for a dollar? That sounds like a great deal." So the Renaissance guy Paul walks me through it. It's rough. It was the Church of the Nazarene. Um, I was speaking at the Cincinnati Rotary Club. This is pretty cool at the Crew Tower, and I said I just bought a building from a Nazarene, or there was a Church of the Nazarene. If there's any Nazarenes out there, I want to meet you. I want to know what you're all about. My commercial broker, he's been working with me like 10 years now. He said, "Hi, I'm Craig Roberts. I'm a Nazarene," which is so great, you know. So uh, I bought this building for a dollar, and it was full of mold and it was full of asbestos styles, But I'm kind of full of myself. I'm like, oh man, I can buy, I bought the theater, I all this environmental, it's no big deal. Challenging, but I bought it and um, it was crazy. The ad district, then they funded us, then they funded our apprenticeship program. Really, you know, interesting things. The building though, I put in a roof on it, the Kentucky Department of Tourism. Uh, I got a tourism development loan, which is kind of crazy because like the circus, they're like, what's a circus? And I said, well, how much money are you spending on a NASCAR track? All right. <laughs> how much money? Anybody have an idea how much we spend on a NASCAR track? More than 10 million? Yes. Less than 50 million? Maybe. Probably not. How about, how about our uh, Ark Park and the Creation Museum? Huh? How much have we spent there? All right. So uh, I say that. The $100,000 tours and development loan that led though that we got to make our circus cool, it's been interesting. So I will say there are many elected clowns uh, and there are very few professionals, okay? <laughs> and uh, my project has worked because we work with everybody. We work with people in jail, we work with people in wheelchairs. We've hosted artists from 43 different countries to love though, and it is a fun game to play. Most visas go to blue states, okay? Like statistically speaking, like 70% of visas go to blue states. And what H-1B visa is like an Indian programmer, let's say, and Google will get most of these. It's a competitive visa for special jobs. I'll put an ad on LinkedIn for a, a, a circus artist. And 20 people in Argentina will apply. No one in America will apply. Then I take it to Congressman Massey and uh, Senator Mitch McConnell. I say, hey guys, why are all these visas going to blue states? I need this visa, this is a job. Are you pro-business? So it's been a lot of fun. We've hosted these artists legally. Um, and as a clown, I do like to rock it just a little bit. I thank you so much for having the opportunity to come and speak at the Rotary Club. And take your feathers home. And if you're in trouble, don't call the law. Don't call Blake Maislin. Call Paulie the Clown. I'll get you to a circus in Malaysia where no one will find you, okay? <laughs> All right, thank you.
That's right. Um, my buddy Tom Gaither is an artist in Ludlow. He's been in Ludlow forever. He's with the Covington Rotary. And we had three kids from Ludlow and a kid from Ghana performing at their 100th birthday party at the Fort Mitchell Country Club um, 10 years ago. All right? And these kids, all both the kids from Ghana and the kids from Ludlow, they'd never been to a country club before. They didn't know it was free Coke. I said, that's not a free Coke. That Coke is a very expensive Coke, but somebody's on somebody else's tab. So uh, thank you, Rotary. Yeah, I've been, I'm doing my Rotary tour. I did 100th uh, here at Maysville, 100th in Covington. I did Cincinnati. So um, I love to talk. So thank you very much. And I'll take questions. Any other questions? Questions? Yes, please. I can't, it's hard for me to wrap my head around that you're batting your hunger with these kids. How many did you have to go through? Do you say, man, this ain't working? Or? Um, it's, well, there's a young man from Sudan. When I met him from my old service in Chicago, all he did was line everything up and shoot at it because that's what he grew up seeing as a refugee. He was killed last February in some drive-by shootings in Chicago. Now, it's terrible. He wrote me a letter when he was in jail in, in Illinois, and I worked with the Ad District. I got him, I got selective service. I got his ID. I got everything lined up for him to work, live in Ludlow, work in Ludlow. We had counseling for him. We had a job, we had a house. But the court up there didn't think that it was real and he was remanded back to custody and it was too bad. So like, I'm not batting a thousand, but you know, there are two young people from Ludlow who parents still live in town and are on public aid. One lives in Germany and has been working there for the past eight years and another one lives in Chicago. So my recipe is when you get a poor kid out of their neighborhood, and this could be Bond Hill, the judge allowing them to cross the state line and go to Ludlow, Kentucky, this changes what their perspective is. When you get a poor kid a passport, they do not want to be on public aid, you know? And most families want their kids to stay right there to take care of them when they're old and they need it. So that's tough to get a parent to sign a passport application because once that once this kid has a passport, they're the first to fly on an airplane, they don't look back, they keep going. So it, it's a hard, like that's the, that's the running away and joining the circus, okay? Like I work with the children from Northern Kentucky. These kids are wards of the state, they're homeless. They will learn to juggle in five minutes. The kids at Blessed Sacrament will take five classes, okay? Because they have a lot of excuses, you know? <laughs> when, you, when you're a ward of the state and you want to juggle, you know, and you go to a new foster family, you're the cool kid who could juggle. So that's a little bit how it works. But, you know, I'm looking for pl more places to do this work. You know, I, I would love to reach out to you as a community. If you have um, a space and some kids and some things, this is replicable. If this can happen in Chicago, and this can happen in Ludlow, this could happen in Maysville. And when the kid gets 18, and they get their passport, and you get them out of town, then they become like the legend. Did you hear about that? So my brewery essentially exists so I can employ these people. I've been brewing beer for seven years. We were buying other people's beer for a long time. But the brewery essentially, you know, I'm trying to sell some beer here in town. I don't make a lot of money, but I hope someone tastes Birkus, Birkus, we don't correct people. The Flemish pronunciation is Birkus, but that's all right. Um, but we just want this chance to connect more dots and work with the troublemakers, even if you have a group of folks who are in wheelchairs and while in the circus. Like, again, there's all these people that no one's really paying attention to, and that's like my market. And Paul has come and done some of the elementary schools here, like Soul Girls, and come in and. and yeah. How many kids do you have in your program at one time, and how long are they with you? Right now, I'm really just focusing on the, the children's home in Northern Kentucky. We'll do a 12-week program there, and I'm really trying hard to crack the code to be uh, Judge Mailing. He was a family court judge, and we went out for breakfast. If we could create a Medicaid billing code for circus wellness, okay? <laughs> now you're laughing, but if you're in Kentucky and you have a whole lot of money, what do you have? Yeah, no, but more than, you, even even better. What do you have? Horses. If you got a lot of horses, you've got a lot of horse poop. Okay. If you have a lot of horse poop, you got to figure out what to do with it. So you know what you do? You hire some clinicians. You develop something called equine therapy. So you get veterans with PTSD and homeless children to shovel poop, uh, feed your pony, pet your pony, walk your pony, and the government pays the children's home in Northern Kentucky and also pays you as a horse owner.
Now that is a hustle. I mean, that is access, all right? I'm proud of my visa process, but the kids at the children's home, they'll do 12 weeks of circus wellness, they'll do 12 weeks of equine therapy. Now I propose some of you in this room could maybe help make that happen because when you go to a new home or a new school as a foster kid, you cannot take a pony with you. You can take a feather, you can take a spinning plate, you can do juggling. We are every bit as effective. I would even say maybe more so. So the circus work I've been doing is older than equine therapy. But if you have a billing code, we as taxpayers are paying for people to shovel poop. I'm just a little perspective, everybody, all right? So I don't know. Right now, I got my two teenagers that I'm minding and managing. We have a circus every Saturday at two o'clock in Ludlow. So right now, it's more of an adult uh, apprenticeship program. I've got a dozen people that I work with locally who can drink a beer, serve a beer, do some of those things, because I'm trying to get the brewery ramped up. I bought another building in Ludlow's Opportunity Zone, and we're gonna move the brewery from the theater to this big blue building. I got it on the National Historic Registry, so I'm selling these tax credits. I'm gonna do the same thing I do with the Ludlow Theater and push it down. And that's my proposition, is like every town is a Ludlow. Every Ludlow is a movie theater. People have no idea what to do with. Breweries are definitely oversaturated, but every town has a lot of people in wheelchairs, a lot of people in jail. So <laughs> it's weird, but I'm not worried about getting my beer at Kroger's. I'm more worried about getting people to drink our beer and see our service. Any more? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.